Okay, welcome to our In Conversation webinar. Thanks for joining. Um, we are joined today here by uh, an esteemed group of account management leaders from around the world. Um, we've got phone from France, Carly based in the US, Andy in Australia, Joanne from Asia. So thank you for joining guys. It's, it's hard to find a time that uh, is suitable with all of the time zones that we live in, but great to have you all together. And special guest, Stephen Pitcher, who heads up our business intelligence, who is gonna take us through some very interesting um, analytics and, and uh, modeling of, of the COVID situation. So uh, again, thanks for joining. The purpose of this webinar is to give a global perspective uh, on COVID and the impact on business travel. And also, how do we use data to better inform your decision making um, and how we might start to see a reemergence of travel in markets based on, on uh, live COVID case stats and um, how we're helping clients model um, a return to spend based on, on time and, and the anticipated um, spend increase over time. So it's been a very, very uh, interesting ride uh, to say the least. And from a broad perspective, I think it's interesting to, to zoom out and, and think before this situation happened, um, if you looked at some, some GBTA numbers, the, the corporate travel market was, was very strong. We're on a high growth trajectory. Um, anticipated spend was $1.6 trillion uh, for uh, 2020. That's obviously not going to happen now. It was an anticipated growth to $1.7 trillion uh, the following year. So, um, yeah, we were on a, on a very strong path. We did start to see some turbulence in, in our numbers at the very least uh, with the, the US and China trade issues uh, where we started to see a little bit of turbulence. Uh, we did see some suppliers drop off like Thomas Cook. We saw Jet Airways. We saw Air Berlin. Um, so we did start to see a little turbulence and then, then we fell off a cliff uh, and, and here we are. So. Um, what started out as a seemingly isolated issue as well uh, has definitely grown um, and there's an estimated impact to the corporate travel industry of $820 billion, again going back to the GBTA stats. Um, and we have most companies that are surveyed cancelling 95% you know, plus of their corporate business travel, of their meetings and everything like that. Um, so this is a big deal. And it's not just in the, the, the corporate travel industry, the, the travel and tourism industry as a whole uh, contributes about 10% of global GDP. Um, we as a business travel industry make up about 22% of, of this. So it is, a bit, it is a big impact to the industry, but also a very, very big impact to the economy in a more broad sense. Um, so really the question is, what now and what next? How do we navigate this? Um, and I'm here with my, my panel to, to walk through, um, firstly, the facts. We want to look at the data. Uh, we want to look at um, just some spend modeling of where we're at. And um, also a very, very clever use of, of live data integration into our reporting platform to help understand what recovery might look like. And we're not trying to give you a, a, a scalpel and an exact um, particular day of each country that's going to things are going to turn back to normal, but we're helping you with a navigational point um, of uh, how to you know start making decisions based based on that. So, so without further ado, Steve and I might um, just throw over to you for a, a quick introduction. Do you mind just giving us a quick intro of uh, uh, who you are and what you do? Yeah, thanks, Scott. I'm our Vice President of Development. I oversee development for our client-facing applications across the globe. And my background is in analytics and um, also business intelligence. So <clears throat> it's okay, I'll begin, Scott, um, running through what we've built for our clients. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, so what I'm going to cover off today is two different areas in terms of forecasting recovery. One is financial, and then the second is based on um, case, case stats, new case stats. Um, and I'm going to start looking at the financial side. So I'm going to run you through a slide right here of how we model financial recovery. So on this slide, you're going to see, and I'm going to start with the, the blue bars to the left here. 
Um, this is where in 2020, this is where ticket counts were pre um, coronavirus when it when prior to when it, it had it occurred for us. Um, you'll see month by month here the ticket counts, and then when the coronavirus came, it fell. Uh, business sort of fell off a cliff. So you've got your ticket counts drop significantly. Across the top here, we look at these red dashes, all these red dashes of your previous business year in terms of ticket counts. So you can see the ticket counts and then you're gonna see a sloping at the end of the year. So we're looking at a calendar year. Typically travel slows down um, in November and in December um, for some periods during holidays. But what you have here is you've got your ticket counts and then it fell off. And then here at the bottom here, you've got your actual ticket counts. And then you're gonna see where we are in our current week. And then how we model things is based on a recovery is how many days from now. So if we're in our current week, we hypothetically look at how many days from this point will recovery start. So here in this particular model, we're looking at 30 days to recover. So that's this period from here to here, this 30 days. So we're doing approximately about 1% of the previous year's business during this 30 days. So if we started to recover after the 30 days, that's where we're looking at this week in this period here, you're gonna to start to see a growth. And we're comparing that versus the previous year. So when we're modeling it, the goal here is you see 30 days to recover. And then at the top, it says hit 50% by the end of the year. The 50% by the end of the year is here, and I'll explain that in a few minutes. But what we have is recovery starts. And what we're looking at is a linear growth starting when the recovery starts. And you'll see that growth go week by week. And it closes the margin with the previous year. So when you're seeing this red dash, you're gonna see that margin start to close. And then by the end of the year, so this is your estimated transactions with the linear growth here. And then once you hit week 52, then this being your ticket count, this is your projected ticket count. This is where you were the previous year. Some people, when they look at our recovery model, they, they say, why shouldn't this be a growth line that keeps going up and up and up? But the reality is at the end of the year where business travel falls off during the holiday week, um, primarily around Christmas, Hanukkah, um, New Year's, you've got a, a significant drop. So the idea here is you're at about 50% of your week 52 from the previous year. Yeah, we have it's different, different sorry. Sorry, to so so I know we're going to go into some some sort of live and and um, live data and modeling and stuff like that. And I think just two words to peg in the sand now are uh, linear and exponential. I think that's um, when you were first explaining this this modeling to me as well. The fact that we had an exponential change at the start and now we're anticipating a linear thing. So even though this is just a static explanation of what it is, that's the pattern that you're you're seeing based on your sort of research right so what we've seen so what we've seen is in in the china markets is a linear growth it hasn't been an exponential growth but we we don't have enough markets that are recovering to really give a perfect model um not all models are, are perfect they're really approximations um so we're using more of a linear growth so that linear growth would be you know week one you might be at one percent then week two you're two percent week three three percent four percent and so on and so forth. And that's more of the, the linear growth that we're seeing. So in China, it seems to be going 2%, 4%, 6% each week as it grows. And it's not going in an exponential growth. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'll go into our reporting tool right now, just after I've explained this and bring up our reporting tool. So this is what we're, we, we've created for our clients. So we've modeled every single client we have and what their, their recovery could look like. And again, this is an approximation. So when we're looking at this particular screen here, we've got our companies, um, where somebody ranked in 2020, their, their estimated ticket counts by the end of the year. So when we're looking at this 30 days to recovery, <clears throat> this would represent, and a 50% recovery by the end of the year, this would represent this many tickets for this particular client. Whereas in 2019, this is where they, they were for their total ticket count. So this is the estimation of where their variance would be year over year by the end of the year, if they started recovering in 30 days and the recovery 
was 50% by the end of the year. Now, what we have the ability to do is change the recovery model here and say, well, what happens if somebody starts, we, somebody doesn't start recovering till 60 days from now? And what does that ticket count look like? So you can see that the ticket count, so you've got this flat amount of ticket sales, and then you see the growth where it hits 50% by the end of the year. But that's a pretty gr heavy growth. We might say, well, now we're gonna go to 25% by the end of the year. And this is what it might look like by the end of the year. So now you're seeing what would that year to date variance be for that particular client and what the ticket count would be. So again, looking at the different models, we look at how many days to recover. And so hypothetically, if the client starts recovering 90 days from now, then you're seeing a, a even further drop on the ticket counts projected for 2020. So I'll go back really quickly just to the 30 days and go into the 50% by the end of the year. And what we've done is we've, we've got the ability to look client by client. So our model is built looking at each individual client. So we can run through here and present to our clients what that recovery might look like and what those trends might look like. And from a client perspective, I think that's really useful to be able to give different modeling scenarios um, based on different business decisions. I think a lot of companies that I have contact with, um, they, they, they want to sort of understand in different scenarios what this is going to look like because no one really knows exactly how they're going to return, but they can report this to their executive team to say based on you know, XYZ growth, this is what we can anticipate in spend increase and also from a supplier negotiation standpoint where most of our larger market clients have contracts and spend thresholds and market share and all that sort of stuff, they can have an idea when that's going to start to return, you know, based on their company activity as well. Right. So I think that's, um, you know, exactly. very useful analytics. Just have a couple more stats in here that I think that are important to look at. So we internally, we're looking at a 31 day change in ticket counts. Um, so if ticket counts are still down, that means that, the client hasn't started trending up. So we look at a 31 days versus the previous 31 days. So you can start to see recovery if people are at a plus point. If they're at a negative point, they haven't started re to recover as a company. Same thing with seven days. It gives you just a short window into that recovery. And the next area I'm gonna bring you into is um, looking at case counts and how we look at case counts internally and forecasting recovery. So it's not just looking at the financial models, what we do is we look at how many new cases are reported each day. And we're not necessarily looking at the date, the, the deaths or the, the statistics that are saying how many people have recovered because those, those stats haven't really indicated recovery. The recovery has been indicated by how many new cases are reported each day. So we break this down on a country by country basis. Right now we're getting our data from the CDC in Europe for new case counts. But the idea here is to look at it two different ways. We, we look at it from a standpoint of how many new cases are there by day. So in the blue here, you're looking at how many reported cases are there by day. And then the other thing that we've done in a lot of our analytics is we're using moving averages. The moving averages here are based on a three-day moving average. It's a simple three-day moving average. And the idea behind that is to reduce the anomalies and smooth out the lines a little bit more because there's peaks and valleys. Um, so you'll notice if I go back into the blue, you'll see some spikes there, whereas with the, once you go into the right, it's a little bit smoother doing a, a three-day moving average. And so we look at this country on a country-by-country country basis, so we can go in and look at it on a country-by-country country basis, so even you know, how are countries trending. So if we look at a, a country like Australia, um, where they were, so here's your three-day moving average. This was their case counts by day and how they've come close to recovery. And again, New Zealand, very similar. But going back, <clears throat> the other indication that we're looking for here is using a running total as well. So the running total here is this, this blue line here. Um, and then we've got in the bar chart here, we've got the, um, the new cases by day that are being reported. So the, the reason that this one is important or this particular chart is important is you're looking for the C. And I'll explain to you what a C looks like that really represents recovery in a region. So if I go back to Australia, you're gonna see that C formation. And so this is cumulative cases, this line chart up at the top and your bar chart of the cases reported, new cases reported by day. So you're looking for the C. The C really represents 
recovery in a region. Again, we're looking at New Zealand here. So if we look at other countries, if I go into France, you're gonna see where it's getting closer to looking like what Australia and New Zealand look like. US is just starting to open up that sea. They haven't opened up that sea just yet. But what this gives us an indication into is from a, a traveling country, from a business country, how each, each of our countries will recover, but it also allows us to identify destinations that people can travel to and say where there is recovery and where there isn't recovery. So on top of using the financial statistics, we wanna use, cross it over with the new case counts when we're having conversations with our clients about the coronavirus and where you can travel to and where you can't travel to. So one more thing that we're looking at, how we're, reco we're forecasting recovery is, and I'll go into the, this sort of table, is a country by country and breaking down country by country, the statistics and getting a little bit more data on the countries. I'm only gonna point out a couple of stats here is, so we break it out by country <clears throat> and what we look at is a turning date. And we, we've got where case counts started at 10, that was your first day with 10, but the turning point on case counts or the, the turning point we look at is when, you, when a country has hit its peak. So we've got a date on every single country where we're running, we've got a statistical peak. And what we do is we run through those new case counts and we're basically looping through the records. And to, to determine the peak, we're actually using a three day moving average. So we run through and loop through every single country's data to find its peak on a three day moving average. For the US, the peak on a three day moving average was 34,258 cases. And then what we look at is where are the last three days on a three day moving average. So if you look at the US, the last three days moving average is 20,000 cases. So it's down from its peak where the peak was 34,000. So we also look at the percent to peak right now, that's 59%. So this 20,000 to the 34,000 <clears> is 59%. When we're seeing the, the 100%, that means that the country is still growing and it hasn't hit its peak. So the last three days equals the, the peak. And then you'll see other countries where it's a lot less. So if we look at France, they're at 8% of for the last three days of where they were at their peak. So when we look at the peak, we also look at what's the average daily decline. And then we start to forecast when will they get down to a, that country, get down to a case count of 10% and maybe down to a case count of zero. And what we're trying to do is identify dates. So we've got dates of when will case counts get down to 10% and when will they get down to zero? So we can start to identify when recovery might take place and then when travel might take place in those particular countries. And the idea again is to take the financial data, the new case data, have conversations with our clients and say, this is areas where you are seeing recovery and where countries are seeing recovery and where travel might pick up sooner than other countries. And then also with our forecasting model, <clears throat> when we go into our financial forecasting model, we have the ability to go in there and break it up by international domestic and destination. So if a country was, not projecting to recover, then we can remove them from the recovery model. Yeah, that's that's fantastic, and it's um, so it's really you know like I like I said before, we're not trying to get you know an exact scalpel out to say you know it's going to be exactly you know ten o'clock in in forty two days, but it's so good to have that indication to say this is a very very consistent pattern of recovery here, and and we're very likely to see you know this market opening up. And it's been great actually to see from the first time I saw this, the US actually starting to flatten out a bit and that sea start to create because when we looked at this uh, probably over a week ago now that the pattern actually did look different. And this is a live data feed as well, right, isn't it? So you're getting this, this data to come through. So incredibly powerful um, insights and analytics to, to help us, um, help our clients actually plan for this stuff. And I know there's going to be, you know, government regulations and health aspects and all that sort of stuff. And and probably a much more complicated return to international travel. So it's great that we can carve out domestic and international as well. Um, so that's, um, yeah, that's that's fantastic. Thanks thanks so much for that, Stephen. And um, we really appreciate your work and bringing that to us in the account management space because it helps us. Um, so that's that's fantastic. And I guess um, I'll, I'll uh, pass over as well. And speaking about exponential, um, Joe, just before I hand it over to you for a quick introduction, I think, um, how we actually started talking about this this scenario um, we were 
uh, in a meeting in LA and that was on the 28th of January. And I think at that time, we thought this was, you know, quite a, a, an Asia problem, Asia specific problem. Um, and I think a realization for us both was when you were looking for a mask in a face mask in LA on the 28th of January, and we realized that they're all sold out. So it really kind of snowballed from there. So there's a little segue. So um, Joe, do you want to give a little intro to yourself as well? And then I've just got a couple of questions for you about the Asian market so we can get a little update. Scott and uh, yeah that was actually my first day with uh, FCM so my name is Joanne I joined FCM on the 28th of January um, my background is procurement and account management and I've now come to join as the director of account management for Asia looking after Malaysia Singapore Hong Kong and China um, it was a very interesting introduction to the to the business and as you said we met and um, in LA, we were searching for masks and, and couldn't find any at that point. And um, I guess very much so Singapore and Malaysia was, um, and, and Hong Kong to some extent was still very much, um, not business as usual, but being conscious of what was going on, um, but being very aware of social distancing became the new norm in Asia. And it was interesting to see that really things started um, to happen, the slowdown in December for China. And then as we came into New Year, Chinese New Year, which was the, around the 23rd of uh, January, things really started to lock down. But then this ripple effect continued. So it moved from China then to Hong Kong and Hong Kong locked down. And then we flew on, we flew then on to um, Malaysia and Singapore and the rest of, uh, of Asia. So it was a gradual, if you will, over you know, six to eight weeks build up to this kind of lockdown and realisation of the gravity that was taking place. Um, I think what was interesting to watch as well, given that it was my first week with FCM, was the intensity of, you know, first it was let's get a little bit of reporting and visibility, then it became more of the requirement to have that communication and what was happening in each different country and the restrictions of the airlines and the restrictions um, that the governments were putting in place. Then it moved into very much safety and security and tracking of travellers and Oh, someone's stuck in this location quick. How do we move them back before the country locks, locks down? So it was very reactive and almost every day there was a new country that was locking down. Um, we also saw the revision of um, travel approvals and, um, you know, understanding how we then move that out to what's happening in the different regions. So it was interesting as that ripple effect took, took place. And then following that, I guess, you know, it moved on to a much bigger global um, epidemic that we're facing today. So Asia was, um, yeah, a little bit different in watching that ramp up and we had a little bit more time to prepare in some ways. Absolutely. And I think you you sit in a position where you're, I guess, a few weeks ahead of the rest of the world in, in, the, you know, in the sense of, I know you were, you know, re, uh, re sort of configuring policy and tools and repatriation was, was the focus there. And, and um, I guess you talking to you as everyone else was just first trying to understand what lockdown meant, all that sort of stuff. You were like, well, yeah, we've been living like this for a while and, and all that sort of stuff. And, and I guess being at that vantage point of being a little bit in the future from this, um, have you seen a, a return to travel? I know, you know, we're starting to hear snippets of information uh, and predictions of when, you know, certain countries are going to have a certain percentage of spend. Um, what, what sort of return to travel are you seeing in, in Asia at the moment, being a little bit ahead of the rest of the world here? So it's it's still very early days and very gradual, very slow uptake. And we're seeing um, China is obviously the first one to come back. They're now back at work, back in the office. Hong Kong has just gone back to the office, but it was really just the China market that's now starting to travel. Um, what's interesting is the fares are heavily reduced to try and stimulate the market in, on the domestic side of things. And in the first few weeks, what we saw was um, an increase of flight and scheduling but in actual fact on the day they were ended up being cancelled and consolidated to reduce the numbers of flights which translated to passengers being stuck at the airports so there's a lot more time spent around airports and I guess the processes that travelers were going through just to board that aircraft um, from an international perspective it's still very challenging um, there are a lot of people that uh, are stuck abroad so what we're seeing is the focus now on repatriation um, there's around about 
just as an example, 400,000 students stuck abroad in the USA that are trying to get back to China at the moment. And the challenge here is the demand is high, but the supply is low with limited aircraft availability and, and landing slots. There's also some more complications that we're seeing in China as well, that um, they've got a, a new policy in place where it's restricted to one airline for one route once a week and reducing that capacity to 95%. Um, it's also got the requirement where all bookings need to go direct to the airline channel only. So that's adding complications in terms of supporting our customers. Um, there is obviously exceptions to that at the moment, just being Hong Kong. Um, but yeah, very, very interesting to see that that process. Okay, that's interesting because I, I guess you do hear things from, from outside of the market and um, what you might hear as a return to travel is yes, tick box, there are flights, but the slots aren't what they are. Uh, and like you said, supply is gonna be quite patchy. So so that's so that's causing a different problem for you. Absolutely. To back yeah. into the space and I, and I think we probably might have to anticipate that you know limited scheduling and and you know updating of airline schedules and stuff like that which can sometimes have you know delays in systems and stuff like that as well so um interesting interesting and and um as far as industries go have you seen any sort of like growth and movement from any anyone in particular um there's, there's a few industries that stand out, manufacturing, construction, um, technology, finance, legal and pharma are the ones that are certainly within the domestic for China that are showing that recovery quicker. Yeah, okay. And then the places that they're uh, able to travel to, um, as I understand it, there's some sort of, you know, bubbles that are, that are you know, opening up. So you're going to have like domestic and regional growth and then anticipate it'll grow from there is that yes at the moment it, it's very much china domestic but i guess what we're anticipating is these travel bu bubbles that will start to open up and having these quarantine free zones so for example today they've they've announced quarantine free zones to hong kong and, and macau so i guess within asia we're looking for these travel bubbles to open up so then um there's that relaxation a little bit easier to get on board the planes rather than going down to 14 day quarantine on arrival and making it almost impossible to travel for work <laughs> doesn't make it easy for it to no. <laughs> uh, cool and then just just last question with um with regards i know you've got a, a background in, in the mining industry as well and and you've seen I, I guess you've lived in an industry where travel wellness has always been a a high priority and, and sometimes a compliance issue um, do you do you see any any difference in how business is going to view things like like that moving forward? Like based on just being a little bit ahead in, in sort of recovery thought process now. Yeah, I think a lot of out of this pandemic, everyone has realised the importance of health and safety. And um, if if travel programs programs don't have that mirrored today, I think we'll start to see those considerations come into place. So some of the things that you see in the mining industry, like looking at the total journey. So what does that journey look like? What is the risk associated with that? Where are you transiting? If you're transiting in a risk area, um, what does it mean from the moment you leave your, your door to the moment you arrive at the location rather than the destination? So given all the additional um, restrictions and um, I guess concerns around health and safety, we're anticipating that there will be stricter measures in terms of getting on board, even getting to and from the destination, um, whether that's by, by taxi at the hotel, there'll be additional restrictions. So I think going forward, people will start to look at the total journey duration, which has always been the case uh, within mining. I think you'll also find that people start to look at the um, surrounding environment as well and how they track their travellers, how if they are stuck, how do you get there to support them? So it will be very much around the safety and, and how uh, those, those travellers are supported on their journey as well, which has always been a big part of the mining industry. And I think if that's not in place today with uh, programs, it'll start to come in. Okay, excellent. Well, thank thank you very much. I appreciate that and um, very good insights. And it's uh, yeah, like I said, we had an interesting, uh, I guess, onboarding of you into the <laughs> business, and also you know when we first started, I, I can't believe back in in LA, um, it's gotten to where it is now. So so awesome. Thanks thanks Joanne. And then um, we might take out a virtual um, a trip all the way across to Chicago. Uh, and just to have a little bit of an update. So Carly, do you mind just doing a quick intro there? Sure. 
Uh, hi everyone, Carly Theroff here. I'm the um, Director of Account Management for North America and I'm based here in Chicago, Illinois. Awesome. And, and Carly, I guess there's a lot in the news about how things are going in the US. How, how, how is it on the ground in Chicago? Can you go to a bar yet? What's, what's the deal? No, I'm waiting on the day that the bars will open and I can have a drink outside of my house. But um, yeah, we still have stay at home orders here in, in the state and in the city specifically. Um, our cases, um, you know, are still happening and um, seem to be, you know, going up, um, at least in Chicago, but we are one of the largest cities in, in the US. So, um, you know, our uh, lakefront trail by Lake Michigan is, is closed. Some of the parks are closed. However, a couple of weeks ago, um, at the beginning of the month, we are kind of slowly starting to open, um, you know, things aside from essential businesses, because the essential businesses have have remained open during this time. Um, but, you know, more restaurants are open now for, um, you know, takeout and delivery only. Um, some retail shops have opened, but only for, you know, curbside pickup of your orders. Um, but yeah, otherwise, we're, we're still stay, stay at home. <laughs> well, isn't that that's yeah, I, I, interesting to find out that I guess our, our people in, in China are back in the office, and we're still stuck in, in in webinar land but that's all good <laughs> um so so just a couple of questions as well i guess in the us that's the uh from from our business anyway a lot of uh multinational clients are led out of the us and, and therefore um you know a lot of the control in these situations where you might have a global account manager with a travel manager um you know working to respond to things like that so i guess what's the evolution been i have to uh I'm not guessing because I know as well, but you, you've moved from predominantly risk reporting and tracking travelers. Now, you know, now there's no travelers. So, so I guess your, your focus is, has shifted, right? Like, so yeah. what, what have you guys been busy with? Yeah, so I guess to your point, we started, it was like February 29th, um, that Friday, I, I remember um, that's when things really started to unfold and many of our customers here in the US were wanting to, um, you know, cancel their flights and, and putting like really quick policies in place to say you need approval for, you know, any trip, if you have a trip out there, you need to cancel it. Um, so we were furiously running um, tons of our risk reports. Um, and understanding where travelers were, what flights were still open, um, where they were going. So that was really important information for our customers to have in, in the beginning. Obviously that's kind of um, dwindled down now and we're really focused now on um, what, what we're going to do with those canceled tickets and those credits. And so we've kind of shifted our focus now into, um, you know, as people do get back to traveling, how can we help them to, um, you know, utilize those credits as best that they can. Right, okay, okay. So I guess yeah, there's there's uh, I guess banks, many banks for for clients and tickets to use. So so that process has been has shifted from risk management reporting to unused ticket management reporting and how how best to do that. So so I guess I, I guess the question, how, how have you sort of gone gone about that? Um, I mean, it's a pretty big task. Like, have you had to change anything, you know, operationally or, or technology wise to, to to deal with that in order to help clients or? Yeah, so um, our process is is still the same. So we do, you know, use a um, a third party to to manage those unused tickets, and we get the reports on a monthly basis. Our travelers get notifications as the tickets are about to expire. Um, you know, they have the option to apply the ticket um, if they're doing a booking online themselves through the self booking tool, or you know, calling an agent to apply it. So all of that is is the same. But where we um, are trying to enhance that offering, um, we're, we're you know, just not only with unused tickets, but other things within our business, we've created these mini task force task forces um, to, to really see what we can do to, you know, as travel comes back, how we can make things work in a more efficient way um, to make sure that those those tickets are are used. So that's what we're focused on right now is just um, looking at, from an operations perspective, but also on the traveler side that, to make it easy um, for them to apply and track what is available. Cool. And, and just on that point with the traveler experience there, I, I've got a sneak peek of a, um, like a, a kind of technology hub for uh, a help along the, the traveler journey, which I think was a pretty, pretty cool idea. Can you, can you give us a, 
little bit of a yeah. it's hot off the press. It was launched yesterday. So um, it's um, we call it the Traveler Resource Hub. So it is a website that um, links to various different things. So you know we understand that there's definitely a need for our travelers to have real time up to date information um, that out lines their their traveler journey and what they can expect when they when they are on the road. So um, yeah, it just includes a number of resources. Um, we've created a, a traveler checklist, um, some FAQs, links to different um, supplier websites that detail like their health and safety measures. Um, so that is live, but we are working now to just get that link added to the itinerary so that it's at the traveler's fingertips. So when they make a booking, it's there and they can just access it really easily. Um, so that's been um, something we've been working on for for a few weeks now. So it's really good to see that come to fruition. I think that'll be really helpful for um, our travelers as they you know, try to have a, a, a safe return to travel and, and what that means and the travelers can feel um, you know, at least knowledgeable and know what to expect when when they do get on a plane. Yeah, yeah. Now that that's awesome, and I guess that's that's the thing, isn't it? No one's moving now, but uh, I personally have traveled a lot in, in, in this in this role, and and um, I don't feel the same about getting on a plane <laughs> right right now. You, you do want to sort of additional information about what what's what do I need to be doing on this journey to mitigate. Um, you know, not not yeah. just getting getting COVID or getting sick, but mitigate getting stuck or exactly. driving somewhere without the right documentation. Even moving around Australia, moving state to state, uh, hearing stories yeah. of people and just just landing somewhere where they shouldn't have landed without this, this thing or that thing. So um, yeah, and that's what you know. Part of our um, task force is like working very closely with the airlines. Obviously, we're talking to them on a daily, weekly basis uh, via individual phone calls, webinars. Um, you know, various forms of communication, just so that we have the most up to date information on on what they're doing, so that we can share that information back with um, back with our customers. Cool, excellent. All right, well, thanks, thanks, Carly. That's that's great to see what's happening in, in that part of the world, and good to see that see that uh, uh, Mr. Pitcher was talking about starting to take shape in the U.S. So there's a bit. Yeah, hopefully, we continue on that path. Exactly. Exactly. Um, cool. All right. Well, we'll we might cross uh, the Atlantic now on our virtual trip around the world. And uh, um, fun. I think um, I might just cross over to you and just see how's things in, in, in Europe. I guess before I ask you that question, I'll, I'll just get you to do a little introduction first, just so everyone knows who you are. Sure, no problem. So um, my name is, my full name is Pod Mani, but everyone calls me Pod. Well, you know, easier. <laughs> so, um, been an account manager for FCM for more than three years now. Wow, time flies. Um, so I manage key accounts here in France and uh, big key local accounts and um, and specializing currencies as well. So uh, yeah, multinational clients are also uh, my is my specialty in France. Excellent. Cool. And 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 fun. I think the thing with with Europe, it's an incredibly complex market. There's a lot of countries. There's a lot of suppliers. You've got content that's on the GDS, that's off the GDS. Um, so, so how, how are you, how are you seeing that, um, this play out in, in Europe? Are you, I guess, how are you sort of helping customers understand, um, what's, what's available to them in that such a complex market? Are you seeing it? It is, um, it is complex. All countries have different situations. Um, there are countries that were badly hit by COVID-19. Uh, I'm thinking about Italy, Spain, France, the UK. Others do a much better, like uh, Germany, uh, Greece, Portugal. Um, those uh, had more, less cases and um, less um, uh, death uh, as well. So um, it, it really different situations here in Europe. Um, the providers are also very different. We, you have many low-cost carriers in Europe uh, and we are monitoring the situation very closely because from a financial perspective, we don't know uh, which airline is going to survive uh, the crisis. So that's something that we also monitor very closely. Um, we do um, receive um, 
almost daily updates from our partners, so airlines, hotel change, uh, car rental companies, stuff like that. Um, and I'm part of a task force here in France as well that manage communications to our uh, customers. So what we do is we compile all the information we get, uh, you know, the refund instructions, um, the updates on their new policies around hygiene, uh, etc. And we uh, we compile all of that in a one-page newsletter and we send it to our customers so they are updated. Um, the key being that, you know, sending communication regularly, but not too many, uh, for them not to feel overwhelmed. So that was key. And uh, yes, we, we try to be proactive uh, around communication as well. Um, um, I mentioned that before, um, we, we put out reports, um, you know, to, to see the top routes of our clients and uh, alert them once the doors is reopened. So that's uh, something that we, we're starting to do right now. That's that's cool. And so, so as far as the region goes, it, it is heavily hit. Obviously, we can you know, see, see the numbers and there's a lot in the news about Europe as well. Um, as far as traveling goes, you can still travel within Europe. Is that like there's still business travel? Right. Yeah, um, so some key travelers could still travel. Um, I got um, this, you know, some cases um, uh, in the UK where key travelers keep on traveling. Um, the oil and gas industry keeps on sending their travelers overseas. Um, from, you know, the French market, we had less travels and we focus more on repatriation. So um, because we work alongside the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, so that's something that we um, we did um, a lot during March and April. Um, and uh, right now, post lockdown, um, we kind of see some trends, uh, not right now for France because it's too early, we just eased lockdown last Monday. But if we look at other countries like Germany, for example, we eased lockdown a lot earlier. Um, I think it was during the end of April, 20th of April, something like that. Um, there is a slight increase in domestic travel, but domestic only, um, but um, not that many because travelers are still not confident enough, you know, about, about the safety when they travel. So um, it's going to take time uh, to recover, that's for sure. Uh, so but I think that's the trend that we're going to see. Um, domestic travel first, and then maybe, you know, regional travel. Um, maybe between cities with identical um, epidemiological situations that yes. might reopen. Yes. Yeah, uh, and maybe by rail. Uh, rail might be the first, uh, you know, type of travel that might pick up. Um, and we're lucky enough, you know, in Europe to have a very solid and a good coverage uh, in rail um, infrastructure. Yeah. So that's great. Well, that that's really interesting, actually. That. Um, yeah, I mean, that's if, if you don't sit in Europe, I can tell you sitting in Australia, rail's not something that you, you think about too much, but that, that's a really good point. So the return to travel like internationally or regionally or intracontinentally um, is, is your rail system, which is most likely going to um, open up sooner, sooner than, you know, international airports. So that's something we can think about in policy, in policy formulation as we start to come into the recovery of this. Um, Correct. That's, that's an interesting point. And, and just from a, I guess, proactive standpoint in, in the market where, yeah, you've got, you know, some countries that are still in complete lockdown, you're, you've still got a, a, a while to go in the recovery phase here, but what you're doing proactively is, is actually writing reports on top city of your clients and advising them is open. Is that, is that correct? Yes, so um, for you know, to give you an overview, for example, in France, uh, France had to cancel like 90% of their flights uh, during March and April, and they're starting to reopening slowly. So we got notified today that some routes are uh, reopened. Uh, so that's great news. And with that, we can actually look at the report. Um, I'm going to look at my clients, see that, oh, this route is the top route. It's, uh, it's going to reopen. going to, you know, uh, give them the data, how many flights per day, uh, etc. Um, and what are these um, the preventive measures in place, uh, you know, on board. Um, you have to wear face masks, you have to, to have your temperature taken before you board, stuff like that. So, you know, and, um, 
overall uh, informative document as well it could be sent along um, you know those um, dates okay no that that's awesome that's awesome that's that's interesting so yeah um there's a couple of couple of good things to think about in that in that region and um yeah yeah there's i guess there's it's multi-dimensional multi-language like there's 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 a lot going on and you, you make a good point there's a lot of local uh, carriers in that in that region so um, you know how, how long can we sustain no revenue let's let's hope so let's hope so so um that's, that's really hope. Thanks, thanks, Bond. And so, so just, just finally as well, um, while we've got time, we might uh, take our virtual tour um, back to back down under, mate. So, Andy, um, <laughs> I'll cross back to you. And uh, can you just give a, a little intro of yourself, mate? And um, we can just see what's happening in Australia and New Zealand. Of course. Thanks, Scott. Hi, everyone. My name is Andy Stark. I'm the uh, team lead for the multinational account management team for FCM uh, here in Australia. Um, I've been with the company for, for a number of years and gone through a few disruptions, but I certainly think this one um, this one certainly takes the cake. So um, yeah, thanks for having me today. No, no worries, no worries. And um, so I, I guess uh, for, first question, I know, uh, you know, uh, FCM and, and Flight Centre being driven out of Australia uh, primarily, you know, we've got a lot of, uh, uh, we've seen a, a, a long, period of time with lots of ups and downs and stuff like that and i i think um it's i've seen a lot of good strategies and resilience and stuff like that um so how have you how do you feel like you guys have been managing i guess differently in this situation anything that you've you've done differently you know in, engaging with clients or anything like that um sure. while we can't meet each other <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I guess, um, you know, in terms of our approach in Australia, right now, we're really ramping up those strategic discussions, um, you know, with a number of different user groups uh, in preparation for the opening of the borders in, in Australia and New Zealand, which touch wood is not too far away. Uh, one methodology that we're using to help facilitate that, um, that planning is, um, is something called VPGs, which is, stands for Vision, Plans and Goals. And essentially, a VPG is like a, a deep dive into a problem or a situation. Um, think of like a, a steering committee working in um, working in small groups, reflecting on uh, successes, challenges, uh, and learnings, and then creating a really solid roadmap for the future. So that's something we're doing now virtually, and it's um, and it's working really well. Awesome. And and I guess the the, the question I know you've. Um, you know, you you guys uh, have sort of been driving a lot of these strategic discussions, and out of that, um, any any learnings that you can share? I, I know that you've you've had to you know manage some some policy shifts and changes, like we all have. Any any kind of insights that you you can share from uh, those sort of you know deeper discussions, or, or how you guys are positioned? Yeah, probably a few that really resonate for me. Um, now, I'm sure everybody's thinking the same thing here anyway, but the, you know, the traveler um, physical and mental well-being is going to be non-negotiable. Um, uh, the, the, the business plan for all of our customer programs needs to have a, a really clear and digestible exit strategy. Um, I know Joanne actually mentioned this earlier on about, um, you know, the door-to-door -door, you know, full full journey. And I, one of the things that came up from the from a VPG meeting just yesterday is, um, and I, so I'm just looping back to Joanne's um, comment earlier on. We were talking about, you know, not only the not only the trip and, and the journey on the on the plane and the, the hotel and so forth, but also just being prepared for um, the staff and employee moving into. Um, other customers' offices, and, and whether we um, we've got really good plans around what that looks like. Are those offices safe, and uh, is, is that a safe environment to be in as well? So it sparks a really good discussion there as well. And probably my probably my last point, just around the learnings, is is just it doesn't matter how robust the program is. I think there's always going to be learnings. Um, there's always going to be opportunities to. Uh, be be better and and enhance things. So that's certainly been another key thing that's come out of the VPGs. Right. Okay. Okay. And and the, the thing that sort of resonates to me there is kind of 
the partnership and how you deal with it. It's not just a, um, you know, we're a, we're a TMC and you're a customer um, and we're trying to deal with this separately, but actually not getting in a room, but virtually getting in a room to, to take a really deep dive into, you know, what is your business problem? Uh, how can we, you know, think deeply together and how to formulate a plan out of this, which I think, I think it's a, a great strategy. And, and I think um, the vision planning goals methodology is something that we traditionally have used for, for, for creating a business plan. But I, I love the, the uh, uh, application of this to, to strategize on how to come out of this, this COVID situation as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's just a, I think you, you absolutely nailed it, Scott. I think it's just a really good collaborative way to, to ensure that the, that we're aligned, you know, and, and doing that in small, small groups and, and involving uh, a number of different stakeholders is, is absolutely essential. Excellent. Excellent. Cool. Well, that, that's, that's fantastic. And I know we're, we're coming to the end of our allotted webinar time. Um, so I think that's, that's been a, a great virtual trip around the world. Um, starting, starting in the deep jungle that is data. Um, so Stephen, thank you very much for giving us that insight. And, and just a little bit of a, a summary of that, I think is, you know, um, you know, we do have some really good modeling that we can, we can provide for our, for our clients. And, and also, um, I think just taking in very general terms from the case data that we've got fed into our reporting platform, it was an exponential journey into this and it's going to be a linear or, or incremental um, journey out of this for, for the most part, uh, most likely, and we can help guide um, those those sort of policy making decisions based on this data that we can we can manipulate and, and model. Uh, and, and that's great to see. Uh, I guess the other thing um, going to Asia, seeing how the how this is played out in Asia. Traveler safety is going to be key coming out of this and traveler wellness. So we need to think deeper about um, what the door-to-door the -door experience is and the impact on the traveler. Um, I've had a lot more uh, companies come to me about you know, green travel programs. The fact that the, the, the skies are actually clear right now, I think is starting to resonate with people as well. So that kind of falls into a similar bucket. I think from the US, thanks Carly for that. So we've got um, you know, strategies around all this bank of credit, how do we use that? How do we um, get that out so there's no wastage there? And how do we actually give more information on the traveler journey? Um, in, in Europe, uh, fun, thanks for that update. So we basically, great to see that you guys are being uh, proactive and actually reaching out and saying, this is where you travel to, this is where it's open, here's an opportunity where you can actually move from office to office, that's great. And also thinking about that rail, that rail travel fallback um, plan. And I have seen some policies globally where they're opening up, you know, domestic land travel um, as a policy. And then Andy as well, I think that that VPG concept is something that we, we can all think about. And, and in essence, VPG is like a, an acronym uh, that we love, <laughs> but strategize together, right? It's a, it's a partnership. Um, and, and, you know, if the more we understand your business, the more you open the door to us, the more we can, we can help out as well. So, um, so yeah, I think that's, that, that's a great wrap up guys. I really appreciate your time. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, team, thank you so much for your insights and thanks for being available around the world. And Stephen, as always, appreciate your work, sir. And, um, yeah, that's, uh, we'll, we'll call it a wrap guys. So, so thanks so much.